want to welcome you again to our services for Carmichael Baptist Church. This morning we're going to finish up uh, our latest series of the Psalms. We've been, we started in Psalm 35 this time and are going to finish up in Psalm 40. We're trying to do five of these at a time before moving on to a different series. I mentioned last week that of all the Psalms, 38 and 39 might have been written at the lowest point of David's life. In Psalm 38, he describes this terrible sickness. We don't know what it was. It's not mentioned in uh, Samuel or in Chronicles. But something is overwhelming him physically. And yet, as we read that psalm, we realize that it flowed from a spiritual sickness, a far greater, more deadly disease, if you will. Psalm 39 describes a horrible depression. Maybe David is lying on the same sickbed as Psalm 38, but he's lamenting the vanity of life, and he wishes that he could die to be free of his sorrows. As low as he got, though, in those two Psalms, as deep as his sin had brought him down, David doesn't despair. He does what we all should and can do in every situation. He lifts up those burdens to the Lord and he finds hope. These psalms are psalms of uh, of prayer. Now we come to Psalm 40. And here's his answer. The lament turns to wonderful worship. This contains some of the sweetest praise to God in all of Scripture. It's a complete change in the psalmist's But I believe it's tied to the same time in his life. God lifted him up, and so he gives God the glory. I've actually given this a strange title, and you might have got a clue to the title from the picture there, The Rainbow. Now, if somebody has a sermon called The Rainbow, you might think they're talking about Genesis after the flood, maybe something in Revelation where there's a rainbow around the throne of God. In this situation, it just... To me, a rainbow kind of symbolized what God is doing in David's life. You know, when a great storm has passed and suddenly the sun shines out from the clouds and as its rays actually hit the storm clouds that have passed you, what was dark and terrible then becomes beautiful. That rainbow appears. I'm not going to get into the science of it. It'd probably mess it all up. But I think it's something beautiful God does ultimately in his creation, one of the most beautiful parts of his creation. Well, David's endured an awful storm. And man, it was raging around him as he's on the sickbed and as he's lamenting his sins. And yet God was with him in it all. And now in the light of his deliverance, he's rejoicing and he looks back at that dark time in his life And he sees the beauty of God's providential hand at work. How God had made him to spiritually grow through the whole event. We have a God who shines rainbows on the darkest clouds of this life. That's just something I want you to think about. I want you to apply as we get into Psalm 40. Let's talk about it. Let's break it down. First of all, the psalmist rejoices in what God had done for him. He rehearses the blessing of God upon his life for all to hear. Starting in verse 1, he speaks of his salvation. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. He brought me up also out of an horrible pit, out of the miry clay. You know, every believer, I think, can can relate to this imagery, the miry clay, the horrible pit, that, that gives you the image of quicksand. I've never fallen into quicksand, thankfully, but I've seen enough about it on TV uh, and even in scientific um, documentaries and that sort of thing that the more you fight, the more it sucks you down. That's what happens with quicksand. You're stuck fast. And this is what happened to David. He let his guard down and he walked right into the mire of sin And it sucked him down. And he was struggling with it and he was fighting it and trying to find some kind of answer in himself or in this world or some kind of escape. And the more he tried to do that, the more he just got drawn into it. Brought low. Until he reached the point where he realized that there's no way I'm getting out of this. I'm stuck in this miry clay of sin. 
You know, it's an awful feeling, but that's kind of where you need to get to. We've got sometimes to reach this point where we see our helplessness, where we stop struggling and we cry for help to a deliverer. And that's what David does. What a comfort. The Lord hears that cry. He reaches down, lifts his people up. In fact, remember back in Psalm 37, this was a good introduction to this whole series of Psalms we've been in. In Psalm 37, 23, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delighteth in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. How many pits I've stumbled into. And you know, sometimes I've had to be patient in that pit in the fact that, man, it's been a struggle for a while. But God has never left me down there. He's never ignored my cry. We have to wait patiently, but it's never in vain. Our salvation, let us never forget it. David rehearses that gladly. And then he speaks of his security. Verse 2, he brought me up also out of an horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and he'd set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. Not only is he lifted up out of the quicksand, he's got a firm place to put his feet. How comforting is that solid rock after being in the quicksand, knowing something holds you up. Of course, this brings our minds to the Lord Jesus Christ. Whenever I think of the rock, I think of Christ. I think about what he said to his church and to his people, Matthew 16, 18, Upon this rock, speaking of himself, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. This whole world is full of miry clay. There's quicksand all over. You go to work. You get involved in entertainment. You just go about your, your business, your outlook in life, focused on yourself. I'm telling you, you're going to stumble into it. You're going to have struggles that come when you least expect it. And that's, that's a challenge for us daily. But what a blessing. We've got a God that holds us up. A God that will guide us. A God that will chasten us. A God that will encourage us. And of course, we think about Christ himself. What he really accomplished more than anything is to go to the cross. Not only to take the judgment for my sins, but to conquer my sin, their power, and to make me his own, so that he will never let me go. I belong to him. When I stumble, again, he's going to lift me back up, and he's going to establish my goings. That means to guide us in the right path. He's going to give us clear direction. He's going to show us the danger. And as we follow him, we're always going to be on solid ground. Sadly, we don't, but what a comfort to know he's leading us every step of the way, establishing our goings. We see our salvation, our security, and then the song. David says in verse 3, He hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it in fear and shall trust in the Lord. Remember in Psalm 39, David was so full of trouble that he remained silent. He was afraid that if he if he began to speak, all that would come out is bitter complaint and even blasphemy against God. And so he said, you know, I'm going to hold it in. And he held it in and it just brought him so low until he finally cried out to God. But here in Psalm 40, he's lifted out of that pit. He's lifted out of the sick bed. He's lifted out of the sin. His, his walk with God is restored. And so now he's got a different kind of message that he can't hold in. His heart's so full of joy. His heart's so full of hope. His heart's so full of praise to God, it's got to come forth. And he lets loose this song. Verse 4, Blessed is the man that maketh the Lord his trust and respecteth not the proud, nor such as turn aside to lies. Many, O Lord my God, are thy wonderful works which thou hast done, and thy thoughts which are to usward. They cannot be reckoned up in order unto thee. I would declare, if I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. You ever try to stop? And thank God for all that he's done for you in a day. You know, it's a good thing to try. And we can think of a lot of things, but we're going to always come short. You might as well sit there on a clear night out in the wilderness and try to count the stars. God is so faithful to us, doing more than we can imagine. He doesn't just help us survive. He doesn't just help us get through the hardship. He doesn't just put up with us. He delivers us in such a way that our mouth is filled with joyful song. 
the Lord. He's exalted by that. This is what he desires for you. Sometimes we think God wants me sad. God wants me uh, miserable as I just try to endure life. No, he wants joyful people. And I can tell you this. He is exalted by the choirs of perfect angels. I can't imagine how beautiful their song. And yet the song of one of his people that he's delivered out of the miry clay a failing, pathetic sinner, but one that's cried to him and he's felt the Lord lift him up and he's restored and has walked the song of joy, the song of praise from that believer. That's more beautiful than anything else to our God. That is a precious thing. It's a song of his grace and his power. How that song ought to fill our hearts. How can we hold it in? What God has done for me. Every one of us have something to sing about. We get a little deeper into this, though. David doesn't stop there. He talks about what God has done for him, but then what God is doing in him. Verse 6, he says, Sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire, mine ears hast thou opened. For an offering and sin offering hast thou not required. You know, David, when he is originally crying out to God, and he's there in the sickbed, and he's going through that hardship, and he knows his sinful condition, You know, he might have had this hope in him to get God's attention. Sometimes we pray that way. Lord, I need you to hear me. And as if we can cry loud enough or desperate enough, he'll hear us. Well, what David found and what we often found, it isn't God whose ears need opening. It's ours. And this is what happened to David. David needed to hear the real message of the gospel. Certainly, sacrifices and offerings were the commandment of David's day. That was part of Old Testament Israel's worship as they brought those sacrifices, and particularly the the Day of Atonement when the blood was sprinkled before the mercy seat and all the work of the high priest. It was one of the greatest joys of David to be able to bring that Ark of the Covenant back to the tabernacle in Jerusalem to prepare the plans for the temple. But our salvation is not about those ceremonies. Neither was David's. There was never any salvation in the blood of the animal, or even the moral works of the law. It's not about proving our worthiness or our goodness. Ephesians 2 tells us by grace, in verse 8, are ye saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now David didn't live in the time of Paul where he could receive that epistle, but he knew that gospel by the Spirit. As he's thinking about the meaning of the offerings and the high priests and all this worship, and he's thinking about how those foreshadowed the coming Savior. This is the message that he heard in his heart. God loves me and forgives me not because I am worthy. No, but because he's loving. I don't have to talk him into delivering me. I need to trust him. God opened my ears. Then he stirred my heart. Verse 7, then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book that is written of me. I delight to do thy will, O my God, yea, thy law is within my heart. You know, this scripture is actually attributed to the Lord Jesus Christ in Hebrews chapter 10. And the point of that passage is to show that burnt offerings and sacrifices are not the answer to salvation. As we just mentioned, it's God's grace through the faithfulness of his Son one that's going to be the true sacrifice for his people. But I can tell you there's no better description of our Lord Jesus Christ and his heart and really his glory than verse 8. I delight to do thy will, O my God, yea, thy law is within my heart. This is something that was just amazing of Christ. It's not only that he managed to keep himself from doing evil, he loved good. In the fullest way, to such a point there's no sacrifice he would not endure, even the cross, to obey the Father, to honor and glorify the Father, to show forth his love. None of us measure up to that. Our hearts get polluted with sin. God's law is sometimes forgotten. But you know we're told in Romans 8, 29, for whom God did foreknow, he also did predestinate, what? To be conformed to the image of his Son that he, Christ, might be the firstborn among many brethren. We are conformed to Christ, which means that when the Holy Spirit works in us, regenerates us, brings us from death unto life, we have a heart like Christ's heart. It means that 
We delight to do God's will. If you're a Christian, you love God's law. It's not just a duty, something you put up with in order to, to get a blessing or to get out of judgment. You want to honor God. And you hate your sin. Yeah, the struggle's there, but the struggle's there because you hate the sin. And you see that quicksand for what it is, and you desire to be delivered from it. That's the testimony of God's grace upon us. That's not something we boast in. That's something we rejoice in. Lord, you've stirred my heart. We could add, given me a new heart. What a wonderful work of God that I'm not embracing this sin as it sucks me down to destruction, but crying out for deliverance, and I have a Savior to look to. You've opened my ears, you stirred my heart, and then you'll loose my tongue. Verse 9, the psalmist says, I have preached righteousness in the great congregation. Lo, I have not refrained my lips. O Lord, thou knowest, I have not hid thy righteousness within my heart. I have declared thy faithfulness and thy salvation. I have not concealed thy loving kindness and thy truth from the great congregation. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. That's how it goes. And sometimes that's not good. That's why David was trying to hold it in because his heart wasn't right and he knew what was going to come out was bad when he was on that sickbed, when he was consumed with sin. But boy, when you love God's law, when you delight to do His will, then His truth's going to come out. His praises are going to pour forth and there's nothing in this world that is going to silence that. I can tell you some of the most powerful testimonies, the greatest witnesses I've seen, they're not from preachers, although all of us preachers, ought, this is what motivates us to get behind the pulpit, be faithful in leading our churches. But I can tell you, it's not just preachers. Some people that were even new believers, much to learn, but they just loved the Lord and they couldn't hold it in. And boy, that praise goes forth and it encourages you and it spreads the gospel. This is the answer to a faithful witness. Lord, open my ears to your gospel, stir my heart, and my tongue's going to be loosed with your truth. You know, you look back, and we can see in David's life, and we can apply this to our own, this is why God brings us through the storms. This is why sometimes we find ourselves helpless in that pit, so that we realize His faithfulness as a deliverer. So that we rejoice as he lifts us up in his power and his purpose and his love. And then we become a wonderful testimony to all those around us. You see that rainbow shining on those dark clouds when you look back. In the midst of the storm, it's hard to see. But boy, as that's passed and God's lifted you up, what a blessing to look back and see God at work. This seems like a good stopping point. But David's not done with the song. It takes a turn here that we don't expect. Verse 11, suddenly he's crying out to God again. Withhold not thy tender mercies from me, O Lord. Let thy loving kindness and thy truth continually preserve me. For innumerable evils have come past me about. Mine iniquities have taken hold upon me so that I am not able to look up. They are more than the hairs of mine head. Therefore my heart faileth me. Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. Sounds like a different song. And yet when you stop and think about it, you know it absolutely fits. If David had made it to the end of his life, if this psalm was written just as he died, you know, he could, he could stop at verse 10. He'd go on to glory and be done with the battle. But you know, he wasn't done with life. God lifted him up, and so that path's going to go on, and David knows that as I continue on in this life, there's going to be some more pits of miry clay. There's going to be more struggles with hardships and struggles with persecutions and certainly struggles with sin. So having praised the Lord for what he has done, he begins to look forward with faith about what God will surely do, but he doesn't take that for granted. He cries out for him, to him, for help in the future path that's before him. First of all, Lord, preserve me. If I've learned anything from this whole experience is that I stumble right into the miry clay. I'm such a foolish person. I'm so blinded by my worldly outlook. I'm so weak in my flesh. Lord, I need you. I need the rock to hold me up. You know, this is the cry of a mature believer. 
We don't reach a point where we say, Lord, I got this. Thank you for the, what you did. Now I'm good. Day in and day out to the last breath, Lord, preserve me today. That ought to be a cry before you leave your bed in the morning. Because innumerable evils can pass us about. In our own flesh, we've got these innumerable evils. Not just in the world around us. We need the Lord to preserve us, to keep us from falling. We need to cling to Him like a child, a little child to their parent. Preserve me. Punish evil. Verse 14, let them be ashamed and confounded together that seek after my soul to destroy it. Let them be driven backward and put to shame that wish me evil. Let them be desolate for a reward of their shame that say unto me, Aha, aha. You read that and you say, Is David being vindictive uh, about those that wouldn't stand by him in his struggles or those that wanted to take advantage of him and his weakness? You know, this isn't about his pride. It's not about his throne. He's not like, preserve my throne, preserve my glory. No, preserve. it's my soul. They're seeking after my soul to destroy it. These were spiritual enemies, certainly some among men, but ultimately there are principalities and powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world, Satan going about like a roaring lion. What does he want? He wants to drive us away from the Lord and to ruin our testimony. So this is about victory over evil. You know, it's not right for us to pray vindictively and hateful against anyone, but it is right for us to pray for God's victory over evil and His glory over all, and certainly His deliverance of our soul from the evil that is out there. That's David's cry. And I think it's right for us to yearn for that day when all of God's enemies are made His footstool, when all the mockery and the blasphemy and the lies are silenced and every knee bows to Christ. We ought to desire this more and more as we see evil in this world and as we go through that spiritual battle. Lord, I want you to to punish evil as you deliver your people and bring them through it and bring yourself glory in it all. This is the last desire. Lord, proclaim your glory. Verse 16, let all those that seek thee rejoice and be glad in thee. Let such as love thy salvation say continually, the Lord be magnified. But I am poor and needy. Yet the Lord thinketh upon me. Thou art my help and my deliverer. Make no tarrying, O my God. I love how David turns from himself to us, to all of God's people. This isn't just about his spiritual journey. He wrote this psalm under the inspiration of the Spirit so every one of us could read Psalm 40 as well as 38 and 39 and relate to that. What does David seek for God's people as well as himself? He seeks gladness. Is that right? To seek gladliness? Gladness? We should. Not worldly happiness. That's not the answer. We're not talking about, Lord, I just I, I want a lot of money in the bank. I want to feel good. I want all the problems to go away. You're going to have a struggle in faith if that's your focus. We ask amiss. I want joy in you, Lord. That's what this gladness is about. I want a heart that really appreciates what you've done for me, but more than that, who you are to me. And I want to be glad in you, and it might be I'm glad out in a cave running from Saul or Absalom on David's part. It might be I'm glad in you while I'm in a hospital bed suffering. It might be I'm glad in you while my enemies are, are persecuting me, but nothing can take this away. To know that you are my God and that you, your love is there upon me and that there are assured blessings from you in my future. I can tell you this is a, a joy that God wants us to have. This is a joy that exalts Him. He's not exalted by believers going around with frowny faces and downcast eyes and grumbling and complaining does quite the opposite, doesn't it? Gladness. Oh, we don't ignore the hardships. We don't shed. It's not that we don't shed some tears, but may everyone around us see the joy we have in our God, to see the purpose that we have in Him. That shows forth His glory. It magnifies His name. What a beautiful song. I say it again. Can you not read this and see the rainbow shining through the dark clouds, God's power and love shining out 
even in the midst of David's hardship. Maybe that's hard to get when you're still in the midst of the, of the trial, the storm. You're dealing with temptation and you're dealing with shame over sin that where you've fallen short. You're dealing with a, a challenge in the way of your spiritual walk. But take this psalm to heart. God has never let a single storm ever destroy his people. He's always faithful to lead us through. And I can tell you, if you'll look back at your storms, you'll see he's been working for good. Maybe you don't see the full answer in this life, but you can know it. God is always accomplishing good, blessing his people and magnifying his name through it all. Let's trust him in the future to preserve us, to give us victory, and to glorify his name. Thank the Lord for this, these psalms. I, I hope you've been blessed in this last study, and Lord willing, we'll get back into Psalm 41 after another series or two. How they bless our hearts, how they speak to our hearts in all that we go through as God's people. May the Lord bless you.